Thank you for listening to 1001 Bedtime Stories of World War II by Wayne Perkins. All of these stories based on the book Last Flight of the Daisy May, the story of heroism and hope at 17,000 feet. Story 14, Secret Information Revealed on the 74th Anniversary of the Last Flight of the Daisy May. Today, which is July 24th, 2017, is the 74th anniversary of the last flight of the Daisy May, when everything happened during that bombing raid over Wake Island. So I decided to give a little bit of background information on Chapter 3, which is titled The Farm Boy. And in The Farm Boy, I introduce characters. Now, the stories of the last flight of the Daisy May are all true. However, some of the characters had to receive new names because the surviving crew, when I interviewed them, could not remember all of the names of these heroes. We begin in Chapter 3, The Farm Boy, with these renamed characters. The next several videos will produce many more of my personal heroes. I wanted to honor the men and their achievements in farming, and in some of the other stories in the book, I wanted to honor them the, uh, the best way possible. So what I did while I was writing is I remembered the true stories. I used the names and the personalities of people I knew and admired in my lifetime, and I knew would have performed in the situations mentioned in Chapter 3 in exactly the same way as my dad, Fran Perkins, and his buddies remember the situations. Chapter 3 is loaded with heroic friends of mine who are standing in for the real people performing the real events in the summer of 1942. When you listen to Story 14, Camp Grant near Rockford, Illinois, and then stories 15, 16, and 17, the characters standing in for my dad's heroes are my personal heroes. We start out with Jacob and Tina Nelson, who we introduce in the last episode, story 13, and of course all the little Nelsons, who are based on the Lishing family from northern Illinois. Deuce Nelson, who is Deuce Olson in real life, a real live guy that's still around, Corporal Tom Heavey, he left us long ago and was a close personal friend of mine from Algonquin, Illinois. Sergeant Dale McDowell, who was my fifth grade teacher at Eastview Elementary School in Algonquin, Illinois. And then later on, after getting out of the Army, going to college, he was the last professor I had at Northern Illinois University. He grew into a full-fledged college professor. And uh, John Paul Olson, who is a very dear friend of mine. Many of my friends from Dundee High School from back in the day will remember these kids and these people. I think they too can vouch that these people were very special. I hope to do them the same honor as it was for me to live and breathe right alongside of them. I'm excited to see that they're part in telling a story that's extremely important to me and should be for a lot of people around the world to find out some of the true events that happened during World War II. Even before the attack on Pearl Harbor to get the U.S. officially into World War II, the American farmer was already at work feeding the entire world. So thank you for playing your role, and let's get on with the stories from Chapter 3 from The Last Flight of the Daisy May, Story of Heroism and Hope, at 17,000 feet. The book's now available in audiobook from Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, and in print and in Kindle formats from Amazon.com. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy this story. Camp Grant, near Rockford, Illinois. At the same time at Camp Grant, near Rockford, Illinois, Private Fran Perkins sits on his lower bunk of an army barracks contemplating the forced field march scheduled for tomorrow, his first such forced field march. On a forced field march, the men dress up in all of their U.S. Army gear, including a steel pot helmet, fatigue shirt and pants, and a pair of heavy wool socks and army boots. In addition, each soldier packs a small shovel, canteen kit, tent ropes and pegs, and one half of a tent 
called a shelter hat that attaches to another soldier's shelter hat. Fran packed extra socks and his K-rations to eat during the day. Fran is excited but disturbed at the same time. It is summertime and lugging all of this gear will make the heat unbearable. He is in his fifth week of basic training and he wonders if he has the endurance to march for 12 miles with a 30-pound pack on his back. Even though he's a young, healthy 18-year-old, doubt enters Fran's mind. What happens if I can't do it, thinks Perkins. My brothers Jim and Bob will be sick. My dad will be disappointed and think I'm a failure. Jim's fighting with General Patton's army in North Africa and Robert's with the 8th Army Air Corps station in England. They've both proven themselves in combat. How did these two city boys ever make it through basic training? We never hiked or lived in the woods growing up. We never exercise as we do now in basic training. I'm not familiar with all this stuff, and I don't want to be the one who fails. Fran looks around his barracks, now empty. There are 12 bunk beds on the first floor of the barracks and eight upstairs. The drill sergeant, Dale McDowell, and his assistant, Corporal Tom Heavey, have a bedroom in part of the upstairs barracks. Outside groups of soldiers are talking and laughing, but Fran is deep in thought about tomorrow's activities. I just hope I can do this, Fran says in a whisper. Just then, Fran hears a loud whistle from outside Company B barracks coming from the D.I. or drill instructor, Sergeant Dale McDowell. The whistle is a signal commanding every soldier to line up at a marked location. The phrase, fall out on the company street, is one that every soldier understands and obeys immediately without question. They snap two in a formation of four squads consisting of ten men each that forms a unit called a platoon and four platoons that form a company of 160 men. The company is Bravo Company or just plain Company B. Every time Fran hears the term Company B, he thinks of the popular song by the Andrews sisters, the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. Sometimes he daydreams about being the famous trumpet player, Harry James, and playing this very song. As a whistle sounds several times, Fran hears Sergeant McDowell yelling, Bravo Company, fall out in formation. Company B, fall out on the company street. Thank you again for listening to 1001 Bedtime Stories of World War II, a story of heroism and hope at 17,000 feet. The book's now available as an audiobook from Audible, iTunes, and Amazon, and also a print book and a Kindle book on Amazon.com.